Hello and welcome to General Astronomy Lecture 7, Eclipses and the Motion of the Moon. As the moon orbits Earth, it returns to the same position relative to the sun in our sky roughly about every 29 and a half days. This time period marks the cycle of lunar phases, in which the moon's appearance in our sky changes as its relative position to the sun changes. This 29 and a half day period is also the origin of the word month, think uh, moon. As the, I'm sorry, um, so, okay, so we have phases of the moon, right? And these are all phases we've become familiar with. We've seen them all before, um, but we might not necessarily know all of the names for them and what they mean. Now, I can't really do much more than list these off, and I'm not going to make you memorize all of these. But the point is, you should just kind of roughly know what's going on for each one. So, I'm just going to go down the list and explain them, and this animated GIF here on the right shows you the entire cycle of lunar phases. So, when the moon is completely dark relative to us, we consider it to be a new moon. That is when the disk that we see is completely in the sun's shadow. We have a waxing crescent moon when the right side is illuminated anywhere between 1 and 49%. So right there, you see it. Um, we get a first quarter moon when the right side is illuminated halfway. So right about there in the GIF, you get your first quarter moon. So when it is on the right side and um, um, filling up, you have waxing. Then we get to uh, the waxing gibbous moon, which is when the right side is illuminated anywhere from 50 to 100% essentially. So anywhere in that phase right there. So that is your waxing gibbous moon. So waxing is whenever it's filling up. Then we get to the full moon whenever the disk is completely illuminated. From there, we just uh, start losing some of the illumination, so we have a waning gibbous moon when the left side is illuminated, anywhere from 99 down to 51%, so anywhere right about here in the image. Then we get to our third quarter moon when the left side is illuminated halfway, and then waning crescent when we have a crescent moon that's anywhere between 1 and 49% lit, but decreasing. So waxing is a synonym for increasing and gibbous for swollen, whereas waning is a synonym for decreasing. So again, it's just me rapid firing off some terms for you, but this is the general idea. You should at least be relatively familiar with them as we go into our discussions for the rest of the lecture. All right, well, the easiest way, I think, to understand the lunar phases is with a simple demonstration. Now, I can't do this with you in person, but um, you can do this yourself. Just take any ball outside on a sunny day. Hold the ball at arm's length to represent the moon, while you, your head, represents the Earth. Slowly spin counterclockwise so that the ball goes around you the way the moon orbits the Earth. As you turn, you'll see that the ball goes through phases just like the moon does. If you think about what's happening, you realize that the phases of the ball result from just two basic facts. First, the, uh, half the ball always faces the sun and is illuminated, while the other half faces away from the sun and is dark. As you look at the ball at different positions throughout its orbit around your head, you see different combinations of its bright and dark faces. We see lunar phases for the exact same reason. Half of the moon is always illuminated by the sun, but the amount of this illuminated half that we see here on Earth depends on the moon's position and orbit. So a great demonstration of how this can work. You can do it yourself if you'd like, um, but this gives you kind of an idea of how this actually operates. So the moon is always half illuminated, but we are just seeing different parts of that illumination. That's what gives us our cycle of the moon's phases. All right, so this is one of those images where you will be referencing, that you will be referencing quite often throughout our lectures. Uh, this is another one as well that you will have to come back to if you're in my course for some homework, and it again can become a little bit confusing. But um, let's get into this a bit. So um, the the times given in this figure that you can see are for each phase corresponding to the time 
Okay, let me, let, me, let me start that over. So, the times that are given in the figure for each phase correspond to the time each phase is observed uh, when it's highest in the sky. So, halfway between rise and set. So, for example, that means that this full moon phase is, rising, uh, is highest in the sky at midnight when it's here. Um, so, that's halfway between rising and setting. So, let's get into this a little bit and talk about what this image is actually showing. So, the figure shows the relationship between the lunar phase visible from Earth and the position of the moon in its orbit. For example, when the moon is at position A, that is, the new moon. So, when it's at position A, we see it in roughly the same direction in the sky as the sun. Hence, the dark hemisphere of the moon faces the Earth. This phase, in which the moon is barely visible for a day, is called a new moon. Since a new moon can only be located near the sun in the sky, it rises around sunrise and sets around sunset. Right? So think about that. It's always near the sun. So we will pretty much only see it when it's near the daytime. So it rises around sunrise and sets around sunset. As the moon continues around its orbit from position A, more of its illuminated half becomes exposed to our view. So we're going from A to B, so we are starting to see more and more of the illuminated portion of the sun as we progress. Uh, so the result, shown at position B, is a phase called a waxing crescent moon. Waxing, again, is a cinnamon, synonym for increasing. About a week after the new moon, the moon is at position C. For a day, uh, we see then half of the moon's illuminated hemisphere and half of the dark hemisphere. This phase is called a first quarter moon. As seen from Earth, a first quarter moon is one quarter of the way around the celestial sphere from the sun. It rises, therefore, and sets about one quarter of an Earth rotation, or six hours, after the sun does. So, moonrise occurs around noon, and moonset occurs around midnight. And the moon is highest in the sky at about 6 p.m. So, that's what you see here. So, really take what I'm saying there um, and try to understand it. Even repeat that set couple sentences back to you. It's very important to understand how these things operate. Um, so, that is our first quarter moon. About four days later, the moon reaches position D in the figure. Still, more of the illuminated hemisphere can be now seen from the Earth, giving us a phase called the waxing gibbous moon, where again, gibbous is a word for swollen. When you look at the moon in this phase, as in the waxing crescent and the first quarter phases, the illuminated part of the moon is toward the west. Two weeks after a new moon, when the moon stands opposite the sun in the sky, position E in the figure, we see the fully illuminated hemisphere. This phase is called a full moon. Because a full moon is opposite the sun on the celestial sphere, it rises and sets, I'm sorry, it rises at sunset and sets at sunrise. So it is highest in the sky in the middle of the night, which would be midnight. Over the following two weeks, we see less and less of the moon's illuminated hemisphere as it continues along its orbit and the moon is said to be waning or decreasing. While the moon is waning, its illuminated side is toward the east. The phases are called waning gibbous moon in position F, third quarter moon in position G, which is also sometimes called a last quarter moon, and a waning crescent moon at position H before it returns to that new moon phase at A. A third or last quarter moon appears one quarter of the way um, around the celestial sphere from the sun, but on the opposite side from the first quarter moon. Hence, a third quarter moon rises and sets about one quarter Earth rotation, or again six hours before the sun. So moonrise is about midnight, and moonset is at about noon. The moon takes about four weeks to complete one orbit around Earth. So it likewise takes about four weeks for a complete cycle of phases from new moon to full moon and back again to the new moon. Since the moon's position relative to the sun on the celestial sphere is constantly changing, and since our system of timekeeping is based on the sun, 
The times of moonrise and moonset are different on different nights. On average, the moon rises and sets about an hour later every night. The previous figure also details why the moon is often visible in the daytime. Um, so I keep that figure here in the bottom right as well. For any location on Earth, about half of the moon's orbit is visible at any time. You can see, and in fact, let's just take, about, take that um, for a second and look at it. So let's say we're here in, let's just say we're in Florida. Well, we can see half of the moon's orbit at any time, right? So if you look here, if you look out to your west, you would see the moon over here in its orbit depending on what part of the orbit it's in. Or if you look straight out to your east, you would see something over here. But you can never see anything from position like B, A, and H, right? Because that's behind you on the Earth. So at any time, no matter where you are on Earth, you can see about half of the orbit. You can see that the moon is prominent in the midnight sky for about half of its orbit and prominent in the midday sky for the other half, right? So this half from, say, G all the way back to C the moon is prominent in the daytime hours, right? Because it's near the sun. So, um, for example, if it is midnight at your location, you are in the middle of the dark side of the earth that faces away from the sun. At that time, you can easily see the moon if it appears in positions C, D, E, F, or G. Right? So it's midnight, so you can see anything from C to G. If it is midday at your location, you are in the middle of the earth's illuminated side, somewhere over here. If that is the case, the moon will be easily visible if it's at positions A, B, C, or G and H. So that gives you an idea um, of how this can work. So the moon does appear during the daytime if it is any one of these phases. All right, so let's do a couple of concept checks. So if an observer on Earth sees just a tiny sliver of the crescent moon, approximately how much of the moon's total surface is being illuminated by the sun? Take a moment to think about it, pause your video, and return when ready. <clears throat> Alright, so you'll see this often, but this is a trick question. Because the sun is always shining on the moon, the moon is always half illuminated and half dark. So the moon's apparent changing phases are only due to our observers on Earth seeing different amounts of the moon's illuminated side. So the answer is always half. Next. If the moon appears in its waxing crescent phase, how will it appear in two weeks? So think about that. You can go back to that image showing all the different phases and different times. So if it's waxing crescent now, how does it appear in two weeks? Take a few moments and return when ready. Okay, well, think about this. The moon goes through its entire cycle in about four weeks. So in two weeks, it should go through half of that cycle. So, if we go to waxing crescent, let's go back to our image, we are waxing crescent, which is up here at position B. So, it takes four weeks to go around the entire cycle and come back to waxing crescent, but it asks about two weeks. So, in two weeks, we will be halfway through our cycle, so that will bring us down to point F. So, according to this, our phase should be a waning gibbous moon. And that is correct. The answer is waning gibbous. All right. Although we see many phases of the moon, we do not see many faces. From Earth, we always see nearly the same face of the moon. Thus, you will always see the same craters and same mountains on the moon at all times. This is not because the moon does not rotate. It does. This actually happens because the moon rotates on its axis in the same amount of time that it takes the Earth to orbit, or that it takes to orbit the Earth a trait called synchronous rotation. So the moon's synchronous rotation is not a coincidence. Rather, it is a consequence of Earth's gravity affecting the moon in much the same way that the moon's gravity causes tides on Earth. So the figure that we have here on the right, um, the figure shows Earth and the orbiting moon from a vantage point far above the Earth's North Pole. So we're above the North Pole looking down at the Earth. <clears throat> In this figure, two craters on the lunar surface have been colored, one in red, one in blue. So there's two random craters, here's a blue one, here's a red one. If the moon did not rotate on its axis, as in this top image, so it's not rotating, red is always facing left, blue is also always facing right. 
If it did not rotate as it shows in this figure, sometimes the red crater would be visible from Earth, while at other times the blue crater would be visible from Earth. Thus, we would see different parts of the lunar surface over time, which we know does not happen in reality. So we don't see some craters at one point, and then we don't see them later. We always, from our vantage point, see the same craters on the surface of the moon. So this theory of the moon not orbiting is proven false just from that idea alone. So um, is there a permanently dark side of the moon? No, there is not. To understand this, consider the red crater in this figure now on the bottom. The red crater would spend two weeks or half of a lunar orbit in darkness, and then uh, and the next two weeks in sunlight. Thus, no part of the moon is perpetually in darkness. The side of the moon that constantly faces away from the Earth is properly called the far side. So we have a side of the moon that always faces away from us. Notice this blue crater. Because the moon rotates at the same time it takes to orbit us, that blue side of the moon is always away from us. So that is what we call the far side of the moon. The dark side of the moon is just whatever half is not illuminated, right? So the dark side could be entirely facing us in the new phase or facing completely away from us. So there is a difference between the dark and far sides of the moon. All right, another question. If astronauts landed on the moon near the center of the visible surface at a full moon, so there's a full moon, they land right at the center of it, how many days would pass before the astronauts experience darkness on the moon? Take a moment, pause your video, and return when ready. <clears throat> All right, well, if the moon is full, then after one week, it would reach the third quarter phase. And the point that used to be in the center of the moon's visible surface at full moon would now fall into darkness that would last for roughly two weeks. So, um, if you take a look at the previous slide, here is an example of this happening. Here, pretend the astronauts are this red point. They're at the center of the full moon. Well, it takes four weeks to go all the way around the Earth. The moon does. So, we want to know when they would start to experience darkness. Well, as you follow the moon around its orbit, that astronaut at the red uh, oval will start to experience darkness right about here, which is a quarter of the way through its orbit, or one week away. So, it would take about one week when it gets to that third quarter phase. <clears throat> okay, so the moon and the... Uh, Earth both cast shadows in sunlight, so occasionally we know that the moon's orbit around Earth can cause events that are much more dramatic. So they both cast shadows in sunlight, and these shadows can create eclipses when the sun, Earth, and moon fall into a single straight line. Eclipses come in two basic types. We have lunar eclipses, which occur when the Earth lies directly between the sun and the moon, so that the Earth's shadow falls on the moon. We also have solar eclipses, which occur when the moon lies directly between the sun and the earth, so that the moon's shadow falls onto the earth. Because earth is much larger than the moon, earth's shadow can never cover the entire moon during a lunar eclipse. Therefore, a lunar eclipse can be seen by anyone on the night side of the earth when it occurs. In contrast, however, the moon's shadow can cover only a small portion of earth at any one moment, so you must be living within a relatively small pathway through which the shadow moves to see a solar eclipse. That is why you see lunar eclipses more often than solar eclipses, even though both occur, both occur equally as often. So solar and lunar eclipses happen just as often as each other, but it's a lot harder to see solar eclipses because the shadow that's cast is so much smaller that you can only see it from very small locations on the Earth. So, the figure displaying the lunar phases makes it look as if the sun, earth, and moon line up with every single new and full moon. So, real quick, we're going to go all the way back. If you look at this image, it looks like the earth, the moon, and the sun line up multiple times, right? During a full moon and a new moon, these things are aligned, right? So, why don't we get eclipses twice a month? 
well, something else must have be going on, right? And they are not perfectly aligned. So it looks like they are, but they're not. So in this figure, or if that figure, excuse me, told the whole story of the moon's orbit, as I mentioned, we would have both a lunar and a solar eclipse every single month, but we don't. The reason is that the moon's orbit is slightly inclined by about five degrees to the ecliptic plane, that is the plane that the Earth's orbit takes around the sun. So here is the plane of the moon's orbit in this brownish orange color, and the plane of the Earth's orbit in blue. The two are intersecting, but at an angle of about five degrees. So they are not always perfectly aligned. The only time they are aligned is at this line of nodes. So um, the two points in each orbit at which the moon crosses the, the uh, surface are called the nodes of the moon's orbit. Because of the inclination of its orbit, the moon spends most of its time either above or below this surface. It crosses through the surface only twice during each orbit, again at those nodes. Eclipses can only occur if the line of nodes points toward the sun and if at the same time the moon lies on or very near the line of nodes. Only then do the sun, earth, and moon lie in an actual straight line enough such that an eclipse can occur. So we therefore have found the following conditions for an eclipse to occur. One, the phase of the moon must be full for a lunar eclipse or new for a solar eclipse. And two, the new or full moon must occur during one of the two periods when the nodes of the moon's orbit are aligned with the sun and earth. So that's what this image here is trying to show. Um, you'll get a solar eclipse when the new moon, when you have a new moon, that means that the moon is directly between the earth and the sun but only if it is aligned on the line of nodes. Notice that if you move a little bit, well here the sun, moon, and earth are aligned, but they are at an angle, and so the shadow is actually a little bit below the earth. So we don't actually get a, uh, a solar eclipse in this case. Um, but on the opposite side of things, we could get a lunar eclipse, right? So in this case, um, we can see the configuration work as well, right? So um, we get, I'm sorry, this is still a solar eclipse where you get the moon's shadow cast on the Earth. Um, and if it's full moon, you can get a lunar eclipse, right? So the Earth can cast a shadow on the moon as well. So only when these two things occur can you get an actual eclipse. Right, so again, even in this image, you can see the sun, moon, and Earth are aligned, but because it's at an angle, the moon's shadow might be below the Earth, or the Earth's shadow might be below the moon, depending on what phase you're in. So this is very important, and this is why eclipses are a lot more rare than you might at first believe. So let's go into a little bit more detail about lunar eclipses and then to follow solar eclipses. The shadow of the moon, or Earth, actually consists of two distinct regions, a central region called the umbra, where sunlight is completely blocked, and a surrounding region known as the penumbra, where sunlight is only partially blocked. So this graphic shows you that. So just know that there's an umbra, the darkest region, where the sunlight's completely blocked, and the penumbra, where you still get some darkening, but not total darkness. A lunar eclipse begins at the moment when the moon's orbit first carries it into Earth's penumbra. After that, we will see one of three types of lunar eclipses. If the sun, Earth, and moon are nearly perfectly aligned, the moon passes through the Earth's umbra, and we see a total lunar eclipse, like here on the top. So if the moon passes entirely through that darkest region, all of the sunlight's blocked, and we get what we call a total lunar eclipse. And it turns red in color, which we'll talk about in a moment. If the alignment is somewhat less perfect, only part of the full moon passes through the umbra, and we see a partial lunar eclipse. So this graphic shows you that. Maybe only some of the moon will be within the shadow of the Earth, so you see a partial blocking of the sun, sunlight on the moon. And then there is a third type. Uh, if the moon passes through the Earth's penumbra exclusively, we get a penumbral lunar eclipse. These are the most common type of lunar eclipses, but they also are pretty, well, they're not very visually impressive. It just very slightly dims the moon. Um, so 
those are the three types of eclipses that we may get. Total lunar eclipses are the most spectacular. The moon becomes dark and eerily red during totality, which is when it is within the umbra, uh, when the moon is entirely engulfed. So totality usually lasts for about an hour, uh, with partial phases before and after. Most of the sunlight that passes through Earth's atmosphere is red, and thus the eclipsed, eclipsed moon glows faintly in reddish hues. So we'll talk more about this when we get to chapter 5 of the book, which is just, I believe, I don't know, it's several lectures from now. Uh, but the point is, we'll get into that soon. It has to do with the scattering of light in our atmosphere. Um, but this here is a series of images that I took of, I think, actually our most recent total lunar eclipse. So you can see uh, that the moon is slowly moving into the umbra of Earth's shadow, the darkest region. So as time progressed, it got darker and darker because it was moving further and further into the umbra of Earth's shadow. And then you see it begin to glow with a reddish color due to scattering light through our atmosphere. Concept check 3.4. Is it possible to have a total lunar eclipse without a penumbral eclipse? Take a moment to think about it and pause your video. All right, well, the answer is simply no. Before the moon passes into the full shadow of the Earth, or that is the umbra, where the sun is completely blocked, the moon must pass through the penumbra. So we will get a penumbral eclipse before a total eclipse. And you can see that here. So for it to get to this dark region, it has to pass into the penumbra and then into the umbra. So you will always get this dimming penumbral eclipse before you get the total lunar eclipse. So not too bad that time. Let's take this train of thought and uh, switch over to solar eclipses. We can also see three types of solar eclipses. If a solar eclipse occurs when the moon is in a part of its orbit where it is relatively close to Earth, the moon's umbra can cover a small area of Earth's surface. Within this area, you will see a total solar eclipse, like the image here on the top. Total solar eclipse. The sun is completely blocked. And you can see this here, the umbra of the moon's shadow just barely touches the Earth's surface. This is why total solar eclipses are so rare. You only see them in a tiny little portion of the Earth whenever they do occur at all. Uh, if the eclipse occurs when the moon is in a part of its orbit that puts it farther from Earth, the umbra may not reach Earth's surface. In such a case, you will see an annular eclipse, which is a ring of sunlight surrounding the moon in the small region of Earth directly behind the umbra. So that is what you see here on the bottom. Perhaps the moon's a little bit further away from the Earth now, so the umbra doesn't actually reach the Earth entirely. So the moon only casts a partial overall shadow. Um, I'm sorry, the sun only casts a partial shadow on the moon, and so we only see part of the sun being covered up. So you actually get this ring of fire, what it's often referred to as. And I've never seen this, I've never seen a total eclipse or annular solar eclipse, um, but they are both very much impressive um, sights to behold. And then the third type, less boring, is the partial solar eclipse, when the sun is only partially blocked from view. So, during the few minutes of totality, it only lasts for a couple minutes, the moon completely blocks the normal visible disk of the sun, allowing for the faint corona to be seen. Now, we haven't discussed the corona, and it's not the alcohol. It is the outer regions of the sun, which you can actually see in this wispy-looking pattern here in this figure. Um, that is the outermost layer of the atmosphere of the sun, which we'll talk about when we get there. Um, but you'll see that um, feature during, total, uh, during a total eclipse when you can't normally see it otherwise. And it's really quite impressive. Um, the image in the middle here shows you what a total solar eclipse looks like from space down on Earth, just the shadow of the moon being cast uh, onto the Earth's surface. And then this image on the right here shows you a partial total eclipse moving into an annular eclipse before coming back. So solar eclipses are really, really amazing. And to that point, we are very, very lucky. It turns out that we in America will have a total solar eclipse come into view this year in 2017 on August 21st. 
This map shows you a map of the world with all eclipses, to all total solar eclipses from 1997 to 2020. That's a 23 year span. Notice how little ground is covered by total solar eclipses. In this 23 year span, this will be the only one in all of North America, unless you consider the islands up there in Canada. So this is a really big deal. I mean, it's very rare. Um, so this path actually takes it through Oregon and almost directly through St. Louis and all that. Um, so this occurs, I think, on the first day of classes for us at our campus. So um, I will probably not be there the first day because I will be out uh, photographing this eclipse. Uh, but the point is, if you don't know about this yet, you should definitely look into it. It will be amazing, and it's quite literally a once-in-a-lifetime uh, possibility unless you travel somewhere else in the world in this tiny little path to see another one. So keep that in mind as you go um, into the later months of this year. Um, maybe make a plan for it because you might not ever see it again. So uh, this is our lecture on the motions of the moon as well as eclipses. Uh, it gives you a, a basic idea of how all this stuff works. Now at this point, if you're in my course, this is probably where we'll stop. This is what I would consider like unit one of our material and we'll have our first exam covering everything through these first seven lectures. What we'll do next is we'll transition now into talking about our solar system and the planets. So we'll have several lectures discussing the solar system as a whole, how it formed, we'll talk about each of the planets in a bit of detail, and then we'll have a test on all that material, on our solar system and on the planets, before we finally transition into stars. So, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you around next time.